the arts. From music to dance to throwing pots to making bad paintings to weaving baskets. The arts being used as tools for healing broken relationships and building better communities. On the one hand, it feels like those are two separate things, conflict resolution and the arts. My guest on the program today will be Dr. Michelle LeBaron, a Canadian law professor who is doing research on the convergence of the arts and the healing of psyches, relationships, and societies. I chatted with Michelle at the Porch Gathering in Asheville, North Carolina in March. Good day to you wherever you are this morning. This is Next 2.0 with Marcus Atkinson, and I am Chuck Camerata, one of the co-hosts of the program. Michelle LeBaron is a law professor at the University of British Columbia and is an internationally recognized interdisciplinary scholar on conflict transformation, the arts, and resilience. That interdisciplinary thing throws a lot of us. But what it means to me is that she's a person with a very big brain who can bring together knowledge and insights from lots of different disciplines and make some sense of it all in a way that can lead to better practices and help us to build better communities. Her current research is on two main areas, conflict across religious and worldview differences and the role of the arts in developing stories and practices that promote reconciliation. She's written a bunch of books. The Choreography of, Revolution, of Resolution is the latest, and I think it's fair to call her a cultural bridge builder. And I was enlightened and inspired by my conversation with her. So without further delay, here's my conversation with Dr. Michelle LeBaron. It strikes me as I read your introduction that culture is a thing that's largely misunderstood in the common mind. And I say that as a person who has worked cross-culturally with groups in Central America and Africa, but also because of the work that I've become aware of at home here in the States where we are not culturally monolithic. Uh, and that the conflicts that we are dealing with in American society and I think around the world, as I look at what's going on worldwide, are really cultural conflicts. So before we get into the art aspect of things, I'd like to ask you if that makes sense to you. Do you agree with that statement and that assessment that our, that our conflicts are largely cultural? And you are doing kind of cross-cultural work. Indeed. So thank you for the question, Chuck. <laughs> I have written two books on intercultural conflict and I have thought about it for a lot of my career hmm. because as you have said I became convinced that in many disputes and conflicts people were unaware of the salience of culture hmm. they were unaware uh, and rather attributed things that were not working well across difference to someone's personality, to someone's malevolence, mm. to someone's uh, intransigence. And so <laughs> culture is so important because I think we humans have a default, which is, of course, people more or less see the world the way that I do. Mm. And if it's less, well, then they don't make quite as much sense. We tend to revert back to our own reference point or the shared reference points of our smaller groups, whether they're linguistic, whether they're about sexual orientation or about gender or about religion or about region Absolutely. or rural urban divides or whatever. So I think that's so important that all of us be engaged in an inquiry about the cultural lenses we're looking through hmm. and to realize that many conflicts have a component which is cultural. However, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are a couple of other things to say about that which I wasn't thinking of as much when hmm. I wrote my books back hmm. in 2016 and the early 2000s respectively. And that is that um, it's bigger than culture, okay. these differences that divide us. And they have to do also with worldviews. And worldviews are kind of our bedrock of being. Worldviews are those things that are even less accessible to us than culture because less conscious. But they have to do with 
the way that we take in information and decide what's true and what's not true. So these lenses, these worldview lenses, are yes. shaped to a yes. certain degree by our culture, yes, but not just by our culture. But not just by our culture. And, um, and what's so important is to recognize that those things, our worldviews, which are much bigger, I would see sub, um, culture as a subset of worldviews, are shaping the way that we're seeing things. They're shaping the polarities that are mm. widening between peoples. Mm. And that's important. And at the same time, you may know and remember years ago, I think it was after 9-11, um, Samuel Huntington wrote about the clash of civilizations mm -hmm. and he said, you know, everything is going to fall apart because you're going to have this grand clash of civilizations. I think that's also wrong. Mm. You know, we can't so much attribute conflict to culture and worldviews that we fall into the abyss of the clash of civilizations, which if you read Huntington back in the day, sounded like we were headed for a chasm that we could not avoid. Hmm. And I also don't think that's true. That's really encouraging to hear. <laughs> <laughs> so much of what's out there today has to do with uh, this particular time of conflict is leading us to the end. That's it, uh, that's and, right. Um, it's quite a nihilistic vision. It is, yes. it is. And, and so if that's kind of your take, mm -hmm. And I think the polarities, politically in the United States especially, are playing on that. They, they need us to buy in so yes. that we'll be on their side. It fuels yeah. the polarities. Yeah. Absolutely. And the polarities yes. are a, a big part of what stokes people responding to the polarities are fears. That we're going to fall into this civilization conflict, this cataclysm, if our side doesn't win. That's right. And our side is right. Exactly. And our side makes sense. And the other side is wrong and they don't make sense. Right. So we don't want to be over there. But I will tell you that I did at one time many, many interviews with people who were pro-life and pro-choice. Mm. And one of the things that pro-life and pro-choice people found after being in sustained dialogue with each other is that they were more similar than they thought. Mm. How, how do we... I think that's a question. This is not part of what I thought I would talk to you about. But... <laughs> I'm interested in tools that can be used to bring people together to be in dialogue because I think that's, we live in our silos today. The internet was supposed to bring us together, you know, but it hasn't. It has divided us further because we all live in our little echo chambers. That's it. So how do we bring people together for dialogue? I, I need to be able to, to sit down at a table with a MAGA person. Yes. With a... Christian nationalist. Yes. And and be a real human being to them and vice versa. Yes. So are you is there anything in your work that you're doing that helps make that happen? I'm going to go back to the pro-life, pro-choice dialogues okay. because I learned a lot. This was through an organization which existed then called the Network for Life and Choice. Hmm. And it was run through an organization which does still exist called Search for Common Ground. And hmm. um, there were two visionary women, Adrian Kaufman and Mary Jack Stite, and they devised a dialogue process, which mm. was brilliant. And I'll tell you a couple of the brilliant aspects of it. First of all, they prepared people before they came into dialogue, and they said to them, if you are a Democrat and you are a Republican, we expect you to leave that way. There is no persuasion that's going to happen here. Nice. We're not expecting any epiphanies that one sees that really the other side makes sense. So people immediately feel less defensive because they know no one is inviting them into this process with the surreptitious agenda of changing their mind. Hmm. So you come in. And one of the things that they did, they used stories. People told their stories about you know how I came to my view as pro-life or pro-choice. And of course, one of the things that the stories revealed besides many similarities, was that um, there's a whole spectrum of people who might define themselves as pro-life or pro-choice, right? So it's not a thing, it's not yeah. a box, it's a spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we might all be at different places on the spectrum <coughs> depending on our life experiences and how we have interpreted them. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I thought was most brilliant that they did was they devised a survey and they asked people, they always had equal numbers of pro-life, pro-choice, and they asked people to fill in the survey. 
And the survey asked all question, all sorts of questions about uh, sexuality, reproductive choice, unwanted pregnancy, adoption, all sorts of issues mm. related to that mm -hmm. constellation of issues. And they had a Likert scale, you could agree or strongly disagree. And so they asked, should birth control information or um, you know, paraphernalia be available in high schools? Um, should sex education be in high schools? You know, they asked all sorts of questions and people figured <coughs> it out because people are basically compliant. Hmm. And what they did is they collected the survey and then they said, right, we'd like you to fill the survey out again, mm. but as someone from the other side. Oh, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. It's brilliant, <laughs> actually. So people did it because, again, people are basically compliant. <coughs> they didn't really like to. They said, oh, I don't know. what You know, and they felt uncomfortable, but they did it. Mm. And every time the result was the same, mm. you would find that the, um, the responses from the pro-life and the pro-choice participants clustered fairly close together near the median, hmm. right? Near the, the midpoint. <laughs> and then when, if I were pro-life and filled it out as though I were pro-choice, my responses would cluster way out toward the extreme <laughs> side <laughs> of the scale <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah. So you could show with data, yeah. and remember we trust data, that there's this is the gap between you we see that there's a gap between you but the perceived gap is much bigger yeah and that unsettles the dance yep. between the participants so that they become more curious really wow. how is it that you know media and social media has amplified this gap between us but you might be closer to me than i think and if you are then i have two choices right rhetorically either I thought you were wrong, evil, and misguided, right? <laughs> so either, so am I, because you're pretty close to me, or I need to check out some more about you. Yeah. And that's the one people pick. Nice. That, Isn't that, that good? It really is good. Yes. Um, and, and we're going to, I'm going to get more information about that from you when we're off the air. But um, is there, so the, the, the key thing that, that Michelle works on or one of the key things uh, yes. is the bringing of the arts into this process. Very much. So, so tell me a little bit about the tools that can be used, how art can be used as a tool to bring people together. That Absolutely. So first of all, we must acknowledge that art always has been used as a tool mm. to bring mm. people together. Think of the role of music or dance or theater or visual art in a community. Yeah. You know, and here we are in Asheville where that's very true. Yeah. It's a community where the arts are thriving and where the arts bring people together, even across boundaries or differences or mm. other kinds of chasms that mm. may exist or may yawn before them. Mm. And uh, so it's an ubiquitous thing and it's through all of human history. Mm. As far as we know, stories were painted on the walls of caves yeah. and people made their handprints. So there was a human making an imprint with another human in relation. And the arts do that. They bring us together. One of the aspects of being sort of a biblical scholar, having gone to seminary, and yeah. is understanding how we got scriptures. Yes. And scriptures came come to us beginning as oral stories being shared around the campfire by storytellers, artists, yes. who, who were given the task of yes. giving meaning to the things yes. that have happened to us in the past and guidance yes. for the future. Yes. So art and wisdom were very much wed together in exactly. those ancient pre-literate communities. Exactly. So this is our heritage. Yeah. This is where we come from. And one of the things that we've done in so-called modern society is that we've separated the arts out from community. Mm -hmm. So now you and I go to the theater to see art as opposed to having art in the neighborhood, yeah. you know, having plays in the community. Mm -hmm. And so we've kind of rarefied it. We've created symphony orchestras as opposed to jamming in our neighborhood. And it's not that that doesn't happen, but we have kind of separated out these art institutions from our lives and certainly if you think about mediation or conflict engagement we haven't thought that arts are part of that yeah but actually if we look at contexts where people have been divided where human problems have been knotted knotted with a k mm. um mm -hmm. then 
In my experience, it's actually artists who can provide leadership and artists who are able to help people, all of us, find ways through those knotted relations when actually, if we rely on our logical problem-solving abilities, we often do not come up mm -hmm. with an outcome that works for everyone involved. Yeah. You, I do that. I, I grew up in a Sicilian family. And this is very much a stereotype, but it held in my family that argument and debate were the fundamental. They were the, the language of life. And <laughs> we would be around tables all the time and there would be religious and politics and sports arguments going on everywhere. And um, we never, we, we didn't walk away from those things with deep anger in our hearts because we were together. We were a family. We loved one another. We knew that that was common. That was our basis. Um, so, so getting together and, and being together is yes. just the norm in our worlds. But in those settings today, we don't talk about stuff because no. it's too scary. Think about the pandemic. There were families who could not talk about vaccination, yes or no, yeah. because it tore them apart. Right, and, right? and there's, yes. there's things having to do with sports, Colin Kaepernick kneeling down, and is that yes. a, and, that's right. And uh, politics and Donald Trump is a very polarizing figure, and just yes. on and on and on. How does art help us get past that? <laughs> art helps us so much. Let's back up, Chuck, just a bit and say that um, what we're not talking about necessarily is the art in the theater okay. or the orchestra in the, uh, in the performance venue. We're talking about you and me in our day-to-day -day lives. We're talking about communities trying to get along and running into roadblocks. And then we kind of broaden art out and think about creativity. Hmm. And we think about we can't keep doing what we've done because we <laughs> will reproduce the same results as uh, was it Einstein who said mm -hmm. it. So um, we need to step out of those well-worn neural pathways, you know, that will lead me, you know, it's why in families we have the same argument again and again yes. because we just get into those dances do, with each other. Yeah. And somehow we have some very irrational idea that um, the fifth time we can <laughs> yes. convince the other, right? Yes. Like yes. finally my logic, which is correct, <laughs> yes. will convince them. It exactly. never happened. Exactly, that's right. So um, because I work in organizations and I work with leaders, you know, if I come in and I say, great, we're doing art, the room could empty. Um, <laughs> because people say, look, we have efficiency as our value, we need to be productive, we need to be effective, we need to get this done, and uh, no, we don't have time for art. Hmm. So then the question becomes, can we frame it as, how do we change or disrupt our dance as usual? Hmm. And then we bring in art's tools. Nice. So I'll give you an example or two and you great. can tell me when to stop. That would be great. <laughs> so in my book, uh, Changing Our Worlds, Art is Transformative Practice, uh, which I completed with a number of colleagues while based in South Africa. Mm. It's an edited book. Um, there is a story in that book which is the, about the work of Kim Berman. And Kim Berman is a professor of art at mm. the University of Johannesburg. Mm. And Kim noticed some years ago during the HIV AIDS crisis in South Africa mm. when the antiretroviral drugs were available but were not available in South Africa because they were blocked. Mm. Um, and it happened that in many parts of the country, not only were antiretroviral drugs not available, but people could not talk with each other about birth control and sex and preventing unwanted pregnancies wow. because there was a great stigma about talking about sex. Mm. And so if you were an educator on these topics and went into a village, no one would come. Mm. Kim, with her colleagues, applied for funding and went into all of the provinces of South Africa and created paper-making collaboratives. Mm. 
people went out into the landscape, they gathered the grasses, they gathered the leaves, they gathered the material, they came in. If you've ever done paper making, you really get yeah. gloppy. You know, you yeah. get your hands in it. It's a very physical kind it's of thing. It's a very physical thing, and it's of the land. So there is some healing, there is some connection right mm -hmm. away. Also useful for economic development because many of these communities were very impoverished yeah. and getting more so because people were dying of HIV AIDS. And what also was going on there is that people didn't know their status. They didn't want to get tested mm. because there would be such a stigma if yeah. it were determined that someone was HIV positive. Mm. So through the paper making collectives and then doing some print making. Mm. So people would be encouraged to, with the handmade paper, make prints. Mm. And they would just go out and make a print of a corrugated fence or mm. whatever was there. She developed a print making process that just involved simple tools so you didn't need a big printing press. Mm. And then they made what they called paper prayers. Mm. And those paper prayers, just like the Buddhist comfort custom or the custom we see in Ireland of tying a prayer to a tree outside a temple yeah. or a tree outside a holy well, uh, they would put their paper prayer um, up hmm. to for the community to see. Hmm. And as people got their hands in the pulp of the paper and they got engaged in the paper making process together, bonds were formed and openings happened where people could begin to talk about um, hmm. birth control, yeah. unwanted pregnancy, HIV status. And what happened in many of these paper making collectives is that the rates of people who were tested went way up because there was social support for being tested. Uh -huh. And so people began to get tested in much larger numbers to be able to support also those people who were HIV positive with the choices that they were facing. And this to me was such a wonderful teaching mm. from my friend and colleague Kim because she saw that you couldn't go directly. Yeah. The arts often come indirectly. Yeah. They create a container, they create a context in which yeah. something of what needs to be accomplished can be accomplished. And if you think about it, you know, back to your um, thought about people who might be mega Republicans and people who might see themselves as progressive Democrats, um, they can't come directly at it, mm. right? Yeah. Because one is not going to convince the other of right. the rightness of their view. Exactly. However, if they engage in some work together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a term, I don't know if you've heard it, I think it was coined by a Swedish scholar, diapraxis, being in dialogue through ah. action, right? So suppose that in a given community, people say, well, what we really need are um, more green spaces. What we really need is more childcare. Um, then perhaps people from across the spectrum who both agree that those things are necessary for the community as they work together. Yeah. Relational bonds are strengthened, yeah. and then maybe one is still on one side and the other is still on the other, and yet there's less projection of the enemy image yeah. one toward the other, and polarization begins to be reduced. Yeah, that's a great story, the whole South Africa thing. And, and, and if people take a moment to reflect in their own lives about the times they've done projects like that. Yes. We built a community garden um, yes. On, yes. On, in one of our neighborhoods uh, and brought people together from several different neighborhoods, the, the urban areas and the suburbs. And, yes. and I'm sure ideologically, politically, they were all over the map in terms of faith, all over the map. But they yes. worked together and they got their hands yes. dirty together and yes. became connected and friends, the friendships developed. So it, yeah, it's a really, mm -hmm. makes, makes great sense. And, and back to the abortion example, one mm. of the things that people who are in dialogue with each other from different perspectives about abortion um, wrote papers together about what should be acceptable limits on behavior outside clinics. Huh. Right? Because <laughs> there could, you know, one side says there should be no clinics, the other side says there should be clinics wherever and however needed, and yet they could agree on, okay, here are some red lines. Neither of us think this should happen mm -hmm. outside a clinic. Um, and so here are the boundaries that we can agree on together. Yeah. We don't agree about everything, but let's focus on what mm -hmm. we agree on. And as we work together, our relationship changes. 
Julia Robinson Moore was talking about this yesterday. Were you in that one? Where no. Julia, Julia was talking about um, the the slave owner ancestors that are, or uh, uh, those who have descended from slave owners and those who have descended from slaves coming together to do some of the work that she's uh, involved in with um, cemeteries and building yeah. memorials and yes. how slow the process was because they were working on it together. They were hearing yes. one another's stories. They were building relationships. Oh. And, and it was a really um, a, a beautiful process, mm -hmm. as she described it, that brought people together. And exactly. um, they're still working on that. Absolutely. And, and so that is true, Chuck, that actually this kind of collaborative process is not fast. It's often quite it's slow. Not, yeah. And then there's a tension between those who say, we need to create change right now, and others who are happy for many, many sessions to simply sit and be in dialogue. Yeah. And somehow we have to find a way of yeah. moving on that continuum between dialogue and action. Yeah, I, I think we need to understand both the macro and the micro, the, the long term and the short term. That there are things we have to say no to. Yes. One of my things is we have to put a stop to the pillaging of the planet. And, and that has to happen soon. Uh, we, we, can't, Urgently. we can't have a long process <laughs> of sorting that out because that process ends with human beings being extinct. But we also have lots of other ways, other issues on which we can come together. And even on climate stewardship, we yes. can come together yes. over a long period of time, get to know one another, but we have to stop certain things. So the short term and the long term makes sense to me. And the urgency with which I may think about this particular issue and you may think about it, are two different things. So we, there's always going to be disagreement about what are the really urgent issues. Yes. But we have to work together much, much the State of the Union address the other night. Uh, oh, we were here, weren't we? <laughs> yes, we were, exactly. That's right. So, yes. uh, but I've done some reading about it, and it tried very hard. Biden tried very hard to be conciliatory, un unitive. Yes. Uh, but there are those who just will never hear it. Uh, and um, I, I think that part of the coming together requires that we be willing to say, you can come along if you want, mm -hmm. but we can't include you if you are going to just undermine the process mm -hmm. of, of us getting to know. To, so those boundaries are really hard to fix, but I think boundaries are part of it. And it's all just so complicated in my head. That's why I, I need to talk to people like you. <laughs> it's so complicated. And what we have to resist, I think, because as you said, what you just said about the State of the Union address, I just, what popped into my mind was, what if President Trump were in office and he had given a unitive kind of speech? Would you have been open to it? Would I have been open to it, <laughs> right? And so we have to be aware also of our tendency, I don't mean you and me, Absolutely. I mean writ large, I agree. to pathologize the other, yeah. you know, whoever the other is. That's a good, and, that's uh, a good phrase. and it's so rampant now. Yeah. Yeah. I hear it not only in politics, but people who just label those who we don't understand or who are using tactics that we, with which we disagree, right away we label, hmm. we judge. We do. And the arts are about curiosity yes. and unfolding toward an outcome or a product that we don't control mm. and that we can't necessarily predict. Yeah. With your garden, you didn't know if it would thrive yeah. when you first In uh, fact, that garden didn't up. get built. But you see? we spent all kinds of time getting to know one another in the work. So yes. it was it was great. There's also um, the the use of media, the arts that are kind of those those out there ones, the professionalized stuff. Yes. yes. Uh, I think there's great power in watching a, a movie, for example, yes. with a group of folks and using it to have conversation. For sure. Uh, because there are really great um, uh, great artists out there yes. doing very provocative stuff. Yes. So Barbie, for instance, the movie Barbie. Right. I was not interested in the movie <laughs> Barbies, uh, and and uh, my wife and daughters went and they just raved about the movie. Mm. Came back, said, "You got to see this, Dad." And I, all right, and I went to see the movie, and it is filled with things to think about 
and talk about. It is. It's, it, and so you can be a right-wing person who just wants to write that off, or you can engage with it. And um, so I'm trying to engage with something that makes me a little uncomfortable, challenges me a bit, but is really beautifully done and, yes. and speaks to the deepest parts of me. Uh, so art can find its way into me. <laughs> it finds its way in even when we're defended. Yeah. Even when we already know what we think the answer <laughs> is. And that's part of the power. Yeah. I've worked for years with expressive arts. Hmm. So expressive arts is a modality that uses many different um, artistic forms and is used as a process to get people to come together. Hmm. And uh, really, really exciting the kinds of things that emerge from that. The realizations that can happen when you let go even temporarily of the things you think are givens. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Just to, yeah, to be able to step back and look at yourself in the mirror, look at your look at your culture in the mirror, look at your worldview in the mirror yes. and ask yourself, yeah. is this really helpful stuff? Is this good stuff? Yeah, absolutely. You said something in, in your presentation yesterday that really spoke to me. Um, you said that one of the things that we need these days is not so much, and you didn't say this part of it, you didn't talk about armies, but you said we need armies of artists, that creative, yes. compassionate spirit that artists yes. bring to the table. Yes. Is, um, I think, really important. I think it's so important. And, and that was actually a quote from Romeo Dallaire, uh, the general who was in Rwanda oh, right. during the that. genocide there. And he said, we need armies of artists. And he said, sit with that contradiction. <laughs> and of course, art is about sitting with contradictions. Mm -hmm. I might bring two elements together that you think in no way fit. And then something surprising happens. Yeah. I was just at an exhibition of um, Mark Rothko's work. That's what he did. Hmm. He brought together colors or textures that you might not have thought about doing. And he had a very particular process so that as you stare into a piece of Rothko art, you could just disappear into <laughs> it or it disappears into <laughs> you. And then we're changed. Yeah. Just as, as we're changed if we hear a very beautiful piece of music. Yeah, yeah. It, when we're engaged with the arts, um, it, I think the neuroscience suggests that our brains are never more active than when we're engaged in That's the arts. Um, uh, music lights us, lights everything up. Lights everything up. And, yeah. you know, it's different for different people. For some people, dance lights everything oh, up. Yeah. For some people, visual art. For some people, theater. And, um, and one thing I think is so, so important to say, and I wouldn't want to stop talking to you until I've said this really clearly, is that you don't have to be an artist. Mm. So, you know, I often encounter, and this is a product of our primary education system, I think, people who say, I'm not creative. Yeah. I don't do that. I can't do that. That's not the way that I am. And... Um, or uh, if I'll do a workshop on movement or dance, people say, I don't dance. <laughs> and what I love to do is to say, okay, you're dancing. You know, <laughs> you just moved. And that was quite a graceful way that you moved. You are dancing. We can't not dance. Yeah. And we can't not be creative. Because the definition of creativity, the working one that I use, is just bringing two elements together in a, in a hmm. different way, in an unusual way. You don't have to invent something. And we have a kind of mentality in, in our society where we're all constantly measuring. And so the great artist we measure ourselves against, and we can't be that, so no. we're not an artist. Right. But that's not the measure. Go into any first grade classroom yes. and ask them to paint, yeah. and they paint. And they paint, <laughs> right? And then as they get more educated, yep. they paint with more and more restraint. Yes, that's a great and way. that's a problem. It is, it right? is. And, and with more and more um, judgment on their own work and the work of others so that exactly that squelches that beautiful part of us that is in fact creative and in my mind it, it squelches a part of the divine image in us absolutely um, the creator is wanting to create in us and through yes. us so. it's an inherent human longing I agree um, yeah. yeah absolutely yeah. well I, I could talk to you for hours but my little chip in my computer here says I have five minutes okay. <laughs> left with you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, is, there, is there anything else that you want to say to the world about art? Um, and we're going to be 
editing this at home. So if there is yeah. nothing, we'll just leave it. But yeah. um, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Please extend the time. No, Go for I'm it. <laughs> um, so I want to make a pitch for our bodies. Hmm. I think too often we think that, especially in conflict, we solve it from the neck up, that it is all about us finding a reasoned way out. And the problem is, of course, that we have different reasoning yeah. and we have different logics and we have different ways of standing in the world. And isn't that a good thing? Because yeah. otherwise it would be very boring. Um, so having worked with Margie Gillis, a Canadian dancer for several hmm. years from Quebec, Margie really showed me and many mediators with whom we worked that conflict, our capacity, our facility to work well with conflict is an inside out job hmm. and it's a body job. Hmm. Our bodies as sensing instruments, hmm. our bodies as dancing instruments. So I'll give you one example of something. We went to Switzerland with a group of international mediators, half men, half women. Uh, a few years ago with Margie Gillis and we did this exercise where we worked in pairs and we had to move across a large floor uh, in relation to our pair and the exercise is called everywhere you aren't so hmm. you and I would move across the floor and I could be anywhere that you aren't and huh. you can be anywhere that I'm not huh. and yet we stay connected huh. as we move across the floor that's training us hmm. to solve our problems. Because in fact, if you and I have a difference about where the fence should be located, dividing our two properties, we need to be everywhere the other isn't. Yeah. There's so many possibilities about that fence and yeah. we could litigate about it or we could have that mindset, that body awareness that says, yeah. look, um, you have the adjacent property to mine and um, we need a fence. Hmm. We want, you know, a healthy boundary for the two of us. And let's find a way that we can construct it that comes out of wherever you're not. Yeah. That's where I can be. And wherever I'm not, that's where you can be. And we can find a way hmm. to work on that. Yeah. I, I think an extension of that is that um, we have, it, culturally, we're very much about heads, about so much thinking. And we forget but what we do is when we when we think that we're just talking out of our heads, yes. we're really not. So for me, all of the emotional stuff that goes on in me informs the things that I say and the way that I look at things. Yes. And so my entire being is really part of the discussion. But then I, I um, put the rest of my being on the back burner, on the shelf, close the door, and I only talk to you about data and about, about facts and, and about logic and, mm -hmm. um, and thinking that that will get us where we want to get in terms of convincing the other. Or, mm -hmm. But it's not about that. It's about bringing our whole selves to this. And our whole selves means in my body, I have generations of trauma having yes. to do with uh, in my family with alcoholism. Yes. Um, you may have generations of trauma having to do with your race. And that has to be part of the conversation. And so yes. um, integration of the beings that we are is an important part. And the arts really help us with that. Uh, I really loved what you did yesterday with the movement. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And, and if you think about it, if we go up into our heads, which is the default in a lot Absolutely of conflict. Absolutely right. Um, what we do in cutting off our hearts, cutting off our entire bodies, is we are not only distancing ourselves from important resources uh, for ourselves personally, but important relational resources. Because if we feel each other's hearts yeah. or we share our mutual vulnerability, yeah. that changes things. It does. That's how I've experienced it in, in my world as I've gotten involved with people who are different than me. Just hearing their stories and feeling, God, how hard that must have been. Yes. Uh, and particular story, um, uh, a woman who came to our town uh, as a refugee from Iraq. And she had this huge chip on her shoulder. And I was tasked to do some work with her. And I just, she was not easy to work with. And she was always angry. And, and I kind of wrote her off. And uh, then my friend, um, who kind of put me in this position, 
invited me to lunch and the Iraqi woman was there with us and she said, I want you to hear her story. And she told me the story that had to do with her husband being dragged out of the house and shot in front of their children and her and her children um, running uh, and having to find their way across Iraq and into Jordan and, and before and years in a con not a concentration camp but a refugee camp before yes. they came to the States. No wonder she had a chip on her shoulder. Absolutely. <laughs> it was a whole different way of yeah. seeing her yeah. once I understood her story and I was willing to listen to the pain and the trauma that she'd been through. Okay. I'm so glad you shared that because it sparked something for me, which is to say the arts are becoming more and more popular in conflict work. And some work that I've seen with arts with refugee populations mm. in particular is quite troubling. We need to think of an ethics of how we use the art uh. because it's not just add arts and stir. You know, <laughs> it needs to be trauma informed. Yeah. Uh, it needs to relate to those people who are actually there. <clears throat> if you bring a people, a group of people who have been together uh, or who have experienced the kinds of things that the Iraqi woman you're describing has experienced and say, oh, draw a picture mm -hmm. of what happened to you. Um, it's really not that simple. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people who have been in precarious situations of all sorts talk about how that made it even worse mm -hmm. because it's kind of a command, express yourself, yeah. you know, and there may not be the words, but there may also not be the readiness to express yourself in yeah, image or in movement. Absolutely. And so we have to tread with awareness and yeah. carefully and be trauma informed yeah. in our work with the arts. So I'm so glad that we could uh, yeah. include that part as well. Yeah, that makes great sense to me. One of the things that I see happening, and this is the work that you do, I'm not this person, I don't have this ability. But you do interdisciplinary work. Yes. Um, and I just say about people like you, I'll say this in the introduction. Yes. Uh, I, I'm here with uh, a woman who has a very big brain. <laughs> and, uh, but what, I'm, what I mean when I say that kind of thing is it's, it's synthetic thinking. It brings a whole bunch of things together. Interdisciplinary. That's what we're meaning by interdisciplinary. That's because I have a friend who has a counseling practice called the Trauma Informed Life, who has artists on his staff. Yes. And they're, they're beginning to understand the integration of these things. Yes. That all of life is a part of a part. Um, yes. And when we try to tear it apart and yeah. look at it just based on yeah. in its constituent parts, yeah. we do it a great disservice. So Absolutely. thank you for being willing to talk to me. My um, pleasure. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Please do. I'm just thinking about the whole field of collaborative law, which is um, very, uh, very widespread in the U.S. and in Canada for couples who might be separating or divorcing. Mm -hmm. And the idea is you bring an accountant and a lawyer and a life coach and a psychotherapist and a tax expert together mm. so that as a team, they can serve the needs of the couple. Um so where are the artists, right? Uh, you know, in that, I think collaboration is wonderful, but look who we think of yeah, as being the collaborators. Exactly. What would happen if for any divorcing couple, there were also an arts component? Yeah. There were, they played the music that they played when they met. Yeah. And they played the music that they're playing now to uh, take each other's leave. Yeah. It might be entirely different. Absolutely. That's a, that's a great insight. Um, so, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Michelle LeBaron as much as I did. It was just one of a number of conversations I had while I was in Asheville. And we will be having more of those conversations on future episodes in the weeks and months to come. But also in the weeks to come, Marcus and I and others will be talking about the biggest issues facing our community and our democracy in this momentous election year. You can find Next 2.0 with Marcus Atkinson with current and archived episodes on all of the major platforms each Friday afternoon and on the fourth Sunday of the month at 4 p.m. on NPR WQLN Erie at 91.3 FM. And lastly, before I get out of here, if you want to comment on this show or on any previous ones, if you want to make suggestions for future shows, 
Marcus has created a hotline that you can call. The next hotline is at 814-240-8816. Call us, leave us a message. This is Chuck Camerata, and I hope you have yourselves a great day.